Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the silver one minute chart. Now you all know that we had the long anticipated, long awaited Fed interest rate increase. We got that announcement of a 0.25% increase. Kind of interesting that a follow on of that we got right away from Bank of America was that they're increasing their lending rates, but they're not increasing the interest that they're paying to savers. Big surprise. But uh, you can see the big move here. We had a 8 o'clock opening, and you can see we were below $14 on the silver price. Now, I had said in the past that th we are now in a window here where um, I would expect the silver price to be pushed a lot lower, simply because we've seen the pattern in the past when they suspend the Silver Eagle sales uh, they push the price down. As soon as they resume them, the price comes back up. A little bit different today. We got that rally happening at 8 a.m. with the opening. And then, of course, we had the decision and we had this gigantic move here, probably to shake out the stops or whatever. Now, this is just a normal thing for those of us who follow silver. But if you look at the price move from top to bottom, um, we have a whatever cent move it was um, 50 cents or whatever. It amounts to about three and a half percent move. So just to give you the equivalent on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, or as Andy Hoffman calls it, the Dow Propaganda Average. And by the way, he put out in his uh, uh, commentary today the fact that this was one of the worst days in history as far as market breadth. So it's, it's just a, a pumping game that they're playing. But if we put this percentage into the Dow, it would be 600 plus point move down and up in the course of a minute. So we know this is a fake market. It's not really important to see where it's going because we know it's manipulated. But just in light of what they're doing and what happens, uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, silver is now holding above $14. We'll wait and see what the follow on effects are. Now, if we look at the euro, you can see that that two o'clock marker, we had the same sort of pump and dump effect. We had a initial sell-off in the euro, which would be kind of logical. You'd think, well, um, the euro is going to get weaker because they're paying more interest on uh, dollar assets. But then uh, we get that rally and then a fall off. So another kind of pump and dump fake out. Uh, the other one we want to look at is the uh, Japanese yen. And uh, of course we have that pump and dump fake out. But then we have a weakening in the yen. Now maybe the explanation for the weakening in the yen is the uh, understanding that the Japanese have been at the game of zero interest rates for about 30 years and it's resulted in the complete and utter destruction of their economy. And uh, the Federal Reserve, on the other hand, is deciding at around a decade to exit out of that strategy. So maybe that's uh, bullish for the dollar yen cross. Now, the other markets are kind of neutral. Gold pretty much did what silver did. Uh, a lot of action and then nothing this, of course, is uh, two things. Traders on the floor taking out stops. Uh, we have markets now that you can't use stops because stops, uh, they because the markets are so thinly traded by the public and so much of the market activity is now controlled by algos and hedge funds that uh, the public trying to protect themselves with stops, these stops are known in the market and they're going to run the stops, take it the other way. This is why you see activity like this. So uh, there's no way for the ordinary man to trade. The, the only way you can really trade these markets, if you're trying to take a fundamental view, if you're bearish the dollar or bullish the, the Canadian dollar, whatever position you have, you have to take a small position and just simply stick with it until you decide that it's uh, something's changed. You can't put in stops to protect yourself because they'll run your stops and take the market the other way. That's what we're dealing with with these rigged markets. So let's look at this uh, 
um, junk bond thing. This is a really important thing that's going on here. Um, we have a breakdown in the junk bonds. This is the HYG index. This is the high yield index. And you can see here, this is the long view. Now, the high yield bonds completely collapsed in the financial crisis. You can see that on the chart here. The HYG went from about 105 down to about 60 or so. Now that what that happened, that's not percentage wise that big of a collapse, but when you're talking about uh, yields on bonds and and uh, what your assets are worth, it's a huge uh, move for bonds because bond investors, of course, are looking for that incremental uh, return on their assets. They're not looking for a gigantic payout as stock investors are looking for, say, investors in Priceline or Chipotle are looking at, or Apple or Microsoft or anything else, looking at a five-fold, ten-fold, fifteen-fold, twenty-fold move that they have to pay capital gains taxes on, etc. On on the other side, the bond market is the area to traditionally of conservative investors. Now. What we've seen with the Federal Reserve suppressing interest rates down to zero is that uh, people are pushed out into the higher yielding uh, bonds. And those are going to be junk bonds. At least traditionally, that was the term that was given to bonds that had a, a significantly higher yield uh, than, than treasuries, let's say. Now, for the last five or eight years, um, people have been buying up those trash, worthless bonds. We can see that as I covered when I covered the, the Puerto Rico story. Um, they were basically buying yield with no concern for risk, but we know in a real market, yield and risk are completely related to each other. They're, they're as closely related to each other as supply, demand, and price are related to each other. So if you've got a company's bonds that's yielding a very, very large rate above uh, treasuries or guaranteed bonds, then you have to ask yourself why. And of course, the reason why is because of how risky they are. Now, this Dave Kranzler article gets into what may be going on in the junk bond market because it's falling apart right now. And by the way, let me point out when we look at this chart here, you can see that just recently on this chart, the very long term chart, you can see that volume that came in. So we'll pull it closer to the yearly here. And there it is. Uh, it does exactly coincide with this Fed interest rate increase. So let's read this. Junk bonds are the financial market equivalent of Fukushima. This is Dave Kranzler on Silver Doctors. Warning number three, if you are hesitant to sell your bond funds, use any bounce in the junk bond market to get out of all fixed income funds. Someone asked me the other day about treasury funds. Go read the fine print in the prospectus. You can find it online. If the fund permits the use of derivatives, get out of it. When hundreds of thousands of investment advisors and retail investors loaded up on PIMCO's total rate of return fund, having no idea that it is riddled with derivatives. If you own BlackRock funds, don't wait for a bounce, just get out. BlackRock is the financial market version of Fukushima. Now let's take a look at BlackRock. BlackRock is the shady uh, government run. It's basically government run. It is shady. It is the operation that has been used to bail out, we'll say, the real estate market, buying up a whole bunch of worthless assets. And you can see here that BlackRock, I think it's uh, Fink that runs that, uh, BlackRock actually had a huge rally and then a crash during the financial crisis, but recovered quite quickly. And then you can see it ran into new highs. So this is a... This is a stock that has run from about um, 17 bucks a share in the early 2000s to a high of uh, 371. 
So that's an enormous return, and uh, there's some very shady people involved in BlackRock. So back to the uh, Dave Kranzler article. I heard a rumor today that the Fed is trying to solicit fire sale liquidity bids from private equity funds for big chunks of the bonds held by high yield mutual funds and ETFs. I want to emphasize that this is an unsubstantiated rumor, but it comes from a good source. At this stage in the game, I believe the Fed will do anything possible to keep the system from collapsing. On the assumption that the rumor is valid, which I would suggest has a 95% level of probability, I would also expect to see the Fed, in conjunction with the Treasury, offer private equity firms 0% credit lines in order to incentivize and facilitate an attempted bailout of the junk market by private equity funds. After all, This would be a no-risk opportunity for the managers of these funds to throw their growing cash piles at something besides Silicon Valley unicorns in order to put the cash to work and skim fees off the invested capital. Of course, at the end of the day, if the scenario plays out, it will be just another attempt to kick the proverbial can down the road and forestall the inevitable collapse of the financial system. Unfortunately, the fundamentals which support the idea that there's any intrinsic value in the majority of the junk paper that has been issued over the past five years continue to deteriorate. The primary reason for the Fed to prop up the junk bond market is to prevent the stock market from collapsing. The graph on the right shows what's at stake. At some point, the performance of the S&P 500 and the high yield bond market will be forced by the market to re-correlate. I highly doubt that high yield bonds will converge up to the stock market. The graph below on the left shows the leveraged loans which sit on top of junk bonds in the capital structure are chasing junk bonds in a race to the bottom now. Theoretically, to the extent the top of the capital structure leveraged loans are valued at less than 100 cents on the dollar, everything below them is worth zero. In a strict application of bankruptcy law, liquidation payouts go from top to bottom. However, for practical purposes, bankruptcy works typically, I'm sorry, bankruptcy workouts typically sprinkle some of the agreed structuring value to the debt tranches below the senior secured level, if for nothing else than to prevent lawyers from cannibalizing any remaining values with fees. As you can probably guess, if senior secured debt and junk bonds are worth substantially below par, the equity is worth zero. That is why the stock market eventually follows the junk bond market lower. That is the dynamic that the Fed will attempt to prevent using any possible means at its disposal, legal and illegal. History tells us this will eventually fail. The degree to which the end result is catastrophic is always directly proportional to the amount of effort that went into the attempt to prevent the inevitable. So another excellent article from Dave Kranzler. You can see that he is pre- predicting that the uh, the stock market is going to f- follow the d- junk bond market uh, down. Now, last thing is an article from Simon Black. This is kind of something that you would think is bearish for silver, but not really because it's taking a very, very long view. This is called Amazing. Look at how silver has held its value for 23 centuries. And of course, we would all expect silver to be able to buy a lot more than the bushels of wheat, barley, and and other things that it can buy right now. But Simon makes a great point. He says, Thousands of years ago, an ancient city of Babylon, specially trained scribes gathered each day in the temple of Marduk to record the day's events. They used cuneiform writing instruments and clay tablets, over 1,200 of which still survive today. These scribes kept excellent records detailing astronomical observances and water levels of the Euphrates River, as well as market prices for the most popular commodities like wheat, barley, and wool. It's incredible that we have detailed records of grain prices going back thousands of years. The ancient Babylonians quoted grain prices in shekels, a unit of weight equivalent to 8.33 grams of silver. 
Over the three plus century period between 384 BC and 60 BC, for example, the price of barley averaged 0.02053 shekels per quart in Babylonia. At 8.33 grams per shekel, this would be the equivalent of about 0.171 grams of silver per quart or about $3.75 based on today's price. After converting the unit of measurement from ancient quart to modern hundredweight, that means that barley in Babylonian times sold for $5.23 per cubic weight. I think it's cubic weight when priced in today's dollars. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, yesterday's price for barley was $5.25 per cubic weight. Amazing. When denominated in silver, the price of barley is almost exactly the same as it was thousands of years ago. In other words, if a farmer from 23 centuries ago had sold a quart of barley, he would have received 0.171 grams of silver. Fast forward to today, and that 0.171 grams of silver would buy almost the exact same amount of grain as it did 23 centuries ago. This is an important reminder, especially today, as the entire financial system waits with bated breath. I think he spelled bated wrong there to see if the U.S. Federal Reserve will raise rates, and it goes on. So that's an interesting perspective because uh, sometimes we tend to get away from the long, long-term perspective in understanding that silver is something that has value that goes over centuries. If we look at the silver price now denominated in dollars with this junk bond crisis on the horizon, uh, the Fed pulling out all the stops. And of course, uh, I would have to point out that we have, for me, which is very, very important, and also something that Donald Trump hinted at in one of his uh, points that he commented on is what I will call, and I've referred to in the past, the presidential cycle. We now have a presidential cycle in the stock market and basically the entire economy. And what that means is that where the, when there's a sitting president, uh, he is not going to let things collapse on his watch. You can see that beginning here, the beginning of the Clinton presidency, and then we have a crash at the end of his presidency. We have the beginning of the Bush presidency. We have a crash at the end of his presidency. We have the beginning of the Obama presidency right here. And we are now seeing the beginnings of a crash at the end of Obama's presidency. Why is that the case? Well, I think it's simply the case that uh, as the power of the executive increases, the power of the government increases, their power to threaten cronies and everyone else involved into not letting things fall apart on their watch grows. And uh, we don't see the normal ups and downs that we used to see. So. Uh, that is perfectly consistent with what we're seeing in junk bond market, with the moves with the Federal Reserve, and uh, with the beginning of the end of the Obama presidency that we may see a very serious crisis coming very soon. And we'll talk to you next time.